Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service this evening. Whether you're with us in church or participating online, we're very pleased to have you with us this evening. It's my pleasure this evening to welcome uh, Ian Alistair MacDonald back to our pulpit. Uh, Ian Alistair is well known to us. We appreciate his gifts. We appreciate his willingness to come and preach to us this evening. And Ian Alistair, we look forward to worshiping God with you this evening. Our call to worship. Oh, come. Let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us everyone a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. Help us to do that as we sing our first psalm, which is Psalm 34, and sing psalms verses 1 to 7. And I trust we'll know God's blessing as we worship together this evening. ourselves we are sinners by nature's choice and practice. 
but yet you have opened our door for us through your Son, so that we can now enter into the Holy of Holies with our prayer request. And our request this evening is that you would draw near to each one of us and meet every one of us at our point of need. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that you have recorded all of his life here on earth in your word. But you've also recorded his ascension into glory. And we thank you tonight that Jesus volunteered to come into this world, adding to his person humanity in order for him to be our Redeemer. And he is the only Redeemer of God's elect, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his divinity, he could not die. But as in his, in his humanity, he was able to die. And we thank you that as we read your word, we realize he lived that life of perfection, never sinning, going to the cross to be made sin in order for him to redeem his people, he who knew no sin. And we thank you for the fact that on that cross he bore our sin. But not only that, we thank you that he, he gave himself unto death. The soldiers did not kill him. He gave himself unto death. And we thank you that not only did he go into the grave, but we thank you that it's recorded that he rose again on the third day. And tonight we look to our risen Saviour, who is at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he is making continual intercession for us, continually working, at the right hand of the Father. And we thank you that he is there as our advocate. And we couldn't have a better advocate than as your word tells us, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we thank you tonight that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to make our requests known. And we know that that is what true Christian prayer really is confidently coming into your presence, making our requests. And our request to you tonight is that you would bless us, that you would send your spirit down in mighty power, and that you would enable us, as we worship you tonight, to be elevated above the changing cares uh, from which we've come, so that we can focus our whole being on what it is we are doing, worshiping our great God, and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray in your blessing upon us and upon this congregation of your people. Lord, we thank you that after a long vacancy, they are now to be settled. And we pray for your servant, Matthew Guy, as he prepares to come and be their under-shepherd in, in these coming weeks. And we pray that you would prepare the congregation for his coming, prayerfully praying for his ministry, and we pray your blessing upon him and his family, and upon this congregation, and we pray that they would get a renewed vision to reach out into the community with the glorious good news of the gospel, the best news there is in this world tonight, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners such as we are. And our prayer is that you would bless the preaching of your word tonight, whatever it is proclaimed faithfully, to the glory and the honour of your name, to the edifying of your people, but also to the saving of souls. So Lord, hear our cry, and send your spirit down with mighty power. We pray that many, today, throughout the world, and we know many will come throughout the world, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And... We long to see that happening here. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless all that is done in your name. 
We pray, O oh Lord, for especially the persecuted church tonight. Those who are less fortunate than we are. Who are suffering for Jesus. Who are prepared to die for Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen their faith. And also add to the number. And we pray that their influence would also reach out to the persecutor. So that they would come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray for the situation we find ourselves in in the world today. With the threat of war and further war. We think of what situ the situation in Russia. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would intervene there. It is so volatile. But tonight we can thank you that you are the one who is in control of every situation that is in the world tonight. There are no shocks to you in what is happening. You know exactly what's happening. There are no mistakes in your plan. And your plan is working out according to your purposes. And we rejoice and glorify your name tonight. But we pray, Holy Spirit, and we pray that you would help us to appreciate our need of depending upon you for grace, for help in all our times of need. Lord, we pray for our own denomination. We thank you for its witness here in Scotland and we pray that you would bless all the new church plants that are taking place and we pray that you would add to our number and that you would give to us as a denomination a real vision for mission and may that be true of the church in Scotland and throughout the nation of Ireland. Lord, awaken us out of our lethargy, we pray, and give to us a renewed vision for the glory of your name here in Scotland and in the United Kingdom. Lord, we pray for those in authority over us as we're commanded to do in Scripture. We pray for those in Parliament in Westminster and here in Scotland. Lord, it grieves us when we see and hear of some of the laws that they are planning to place on the statute books and the laws that they have placed on the statute books which are wholly against your law. Lord, we pray that you would stay your hand and we pray that you would raise up leaders within Parliament who would have the fear of God in their hearts and we thank you that there are Christians in Parliament who are speaking out even in these days. Give them boldness and we pray that their influence might reach out to those who are the leaders within our government. Help them to realize that they are answerable to you for all their decisions. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would turn this tide of ungodliness that has swept through our nation. Your word clearly tells us that it is righteousness that exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to the people, and we are weeping for your soul. Lord, have mercy. We pray especially for our children and for our grandchildren. Those who are subject to, in their schools, to such things that we never even dreamt would happen. Lord, protect them, we pray. And we pray that you would bless all the work that will be going on throughout this summer season within camps, through SU, our own church camps and various other activities. In the summertime, Lord, we pray that those who teach our children will be given grace and help to do that to the glory of your name. Lord, protect our children, we pray, from the wickedness that we see prevailing throughout this nation of ours. So now we pray that you would help us to focus our mind on your word now and help us to leave this building challenged with a renewed passion to be like your master. We ask this, Lord with the forgiveness of our many sins, in Christ. Amen. Our next hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Oh, maybe that's just as well. <laughs>
Let us hear God's Word in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 2, and we can read the first ten verses. As for you, you were dead in your, tres- in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ, in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Our next psalm is Psalm 89, and we shall sing from verses 13 to 17. Thou hast an arm that's full of power, thy hand is great in might, and thy right hand exceedingly exalted is in height. time this evening, I would like to look with you at words you'll find in the chapter that we read, and we can read again at verse 4 to verse 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul, in his writings and in his speech, never referred to anyone as a Christian. That terminology was a really a derogatory term, mentioned about three times, I think, in the New Testament, by enemies of those who loved the Lord Jesus. But he does have a term that he uses again and again and again. And he uses it of himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he describes himself as a man in Christ. Now, as we read Paul's letters, we sometimes fail to see the amount of times that he emphasizes this fact in his writings. To be a Christian, Paul says, means that you are a man or a woman who is in Christ Jesus. So I would like to look briefly at this great subject before us this evening, our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Union with Christ, where is he? Union with Christ is like the hub of a wheel. You see, right in the center of the wheel is the hub. And all the spokes coming out of the hub could be classed as regeneration, effectual calling, faith, repentance, justification, sanctification. They're like spokes, but the hub of the wheel is the doctrine of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thought that was a very useful illustration to, to get that message across. But I want to take some samples uh, from Paul in his letters. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 1.4, we receive grace in Christ. Romans 3.24, our redemption is in Christ. Galatians 2.17, we are justified in Christ. Romans 8.1, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we, we are new creatures in Christ. Romans 8.32, nobody can separate us from the love of God, or the love of Christ. And that is just a few samples of the many times that phrase is used in Paul's letter. Apparently, it is used over 75 times in his letters throughout all the pages of his letters. Now, I forgot that I was using the New International Version tonight. I did this the last time as well. Um, so I'm going to read out these two verses from the English Standard Version because that's what I based my message on this evening. And it reads like this. But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, commenting on these verses, says this. We have here one of the profoundest statements with the respect to the condition and position of the Christian that can be found anywhere in Scripture. These are powerful words. Man in Christ. Now, in the first three verses of this chapter, we have a different picture. We have a picture of man in sin. And I hope there's no one here tonight who is in that, uh, that position, a man or a woman in sin, because that means you are dead in sin, dominated, doomed by sin, destined for a lost eternity in hell. That is where we were if we are Christians here tonight. 
But praise the Lord, that's not where we are. And that's what I want to explore tonight, where we are as Christians. We see here what God has done for us. Paul says in particular that he has joined us to his Son. This is something that should really, really warm our hearts and move us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ dwelling in us by his Spirit. Surely that's a guarantee that we are in a position as Christians that can never change. We are adopted into God's family and not in name only. And I would just briefly like to look at this great subject under two very simple headings. First of all, the two words that we see in the NIV. Uh, is it not in the NIV, but in the English Standard Version? These two words at the beginning of our text, which reads, but God. I remember as a young Christian in Inverness, in 1971, I was stationed in Cameron Barracks in Inverness, and I was worshipping in Grey Friars, where I'm still worshipping, but there's been a big gap over the years. But the Reverend Donald MacDonald was preaching one Sunday night on these two words. And I was wondering, how on earth can he, how can he preach for 35, 40 minutes on these two words, but God? But the more you explore it, the more you realize what is, what's in these two words. Two small words, but how mighty they are. But God, where in this world would we, would we be but for God? That should really warm our hearts with meaning. These two words in and of themselves, in a sense, contain the whole of the gospel. The gospel that tells us, all that God has done, God's intervention in mankind. This shows us that the gospel is not remote from our lives. Paul has painted a picture of the absolute hopelessness in verse 1 of man in sin. He couldn't have pictured a blacker picture, someone who is doomed to a lost eternity. But praise the Lord, he moves on in verse 4. But God, here he has brought light into the equation. Radiant light that brings joy with these two words. We see man's ruin in all its blackness. But praise the Lord, that's not the end of the story for us. No. But God, there is hope. Because there is a God who is sovereign, who's working out his purposes on his throne this evening. And what joy that should bring to our hearts. A God who has done something, who has come into the darkness, and he comes and he says, let there be light. And there was light. When this world was created, light shone. Now, as an aside, by seeing these words, in a sense, they transform every situation in life, do they not? All we face, everything we experience, to say, but God, that should make a fundamental change. That should, that's an imagine, you know, when you imagine that, it's amazing. God has intervened in our experience. For instance, if you are facing temptation and that temptation is very strong and you feel that you are directed to, into that temptation, but then you realize, ah, but God, he is watching over me. This God that keeps you, who will keep you in the hollow of his hand, who is my father in heaven, who is my shepherd, the God in whom I trust. And whenever the devil comes to try and take us off our path, we need to come back to this place where God, but God, He is there in control of every situation. Sometimes we look at the discouragements, perhaps the lack of progress in the church, or even the lack of progress in our own Christian experience. And sometimes we're tempted to despair. But let us remind ourselves that our God 
who is a great God, is on the throne. And nothing is beyond him. My flesh and heart does faint and fail. But my God does fail me never. And my God calls me home. And he has an inheritance for me. My God. What darkness. Not being able to think or say these words. What hope, what joy for those who can understand these words but God. This is for the Christian. But what terror it must be for anyone who is not a Christian. Because it means that their destiny is a lost eternity without Christ. But secondly, and this is where I want to spend most of my time this evening Let us look at the salvation that we as Christians are duty-bound to understand. You see, the apostle is not so much concerned to remind the Ephesians of something that is going to happen to them, but he wants to remind them of what has already happened to you if you're a Christian here tonight. You're in this position which is a tremendous position to be in, and we'll just explore that. But before we do that, let us ask a question. What is a Christian? Perhaps you might answer it by saying, well, it's a person who goes to church. It's a person who has some kind of belief, someone who has made a commitment of some kind. Or as the Bible says, a person who has been declared to be just or a person who is growing in grace and who is um, being sanctified. All of these are true, and that's wonderful. But when we've used all these terms and understood all these concepts, we still have a comparative, limited view of salvation. My friends, it is vital for us to understand what the apostle is teaching us here in his epistle. I fear this is something that is neglected to the poverty of many Christians today. So let us look at verse 5 and 6 again. God made us alive together with Christ, and He's raised us up with Him, and He's seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. With Christ, in Him. He is telling us here that salvation is... It means a union with Christ, being in Him. It means that God has joined us to His own beloved Son. And that means that we are tied to the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Again, I want to quote Professor John Murray, who comments, Union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. It comes at the very center of what it means to be a Christian. Union with Christ is the very center, the hub of the wheel. I want to quote a Puritan. His name is Thomas Goodwin. And I found this to be a very helpful situation for us again to understand this great truth. And it's it's written in his book, Life in Christ. And I'm going to quote it uh, word by word as as he writes it. He writes, there are only two men, Adam and Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging from their girdle. Girdle being a strong leather belt around their waist. And on each belt, millions and millions of little hooks And from every hook hangs a human being. Every human being is hanging from the hooks on one or other of these two. Everyone who has ever lived or will ever live, all without exception, is hanging from Adam's belt or from Christ's belt. We are all born hanging on Adam's belt. Born children of Adam, and Adam takes us with him. Where Adam goes, we go. When he disobeyed in the Garden of Eden, we disobeyed. When he is condemned by God, we are condemned. 
<coughs> when he dies, we die. We are in Adam no matter what we do. We are in Adam. No matter how hard we try, we are in Adam. No matter how many prayers we pray or how good we try to be, we are in Adam. No matter how hard, uh, no, and nothing can ever, let me read that again. No matter how hard we try to please God, we are in Adam. And nothing can ever, we can ever do can change that. We cannot get out of Adam. We are hooked on Adam's belt and we can't unhook ourselves. There we are, apart from God's power. There we stay. All that Adam has and did is counted as ours. That is the condition of human beings by nature. Salvation is God unhooking us from Adam's belt onto Christ's belt, so that where we once were in Adam, we are now in Christ, and now hang from Christ's belt. He in turn takes us with him, and when he lives a life of perfect obedience on earth, obeying every one of his Father's commandments perfectly, we obey in him. Every prayer, every act of obedience, devotion, is counted as ours. We keep the law in him. We obey God in him. We glorify God in him. We keep every commandment perfectly in him. When he goes to the cross, we go to the cross. When he is punished for sins, we are punished in him. When he is buried in the grave, we are buried in him. And when he comes out of the grave, we come out of the grave. When he rises up to heaven, we rise up to heaven. When he goes into the presence of God, we go into the presence of God. When he sits at the right hand of the Father in glory, we are there with him. And none of this is our doing. None of it. It is only because we are with Christ, in Christ, united to Christ. A covenant or an agreement was made between God the Father and God the Son that he would do this for his people as their representative, acting on their behalf in their place. And that is exactly what Christ has done. Unquote. I found that very helpful for me to understand where I stand tonight as a Christian in Christ. You see, everything that Christ was is counted as ours, and all he suffered is counted as ours, and all that he did is counted as ours. My friends, what an amazing transaction or exchange. Paul said, we were dead. Now he says, we are made alive in Christ. We were dominated by the three enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now we are raised with him into a new and glorious life. We were doomed, but not anymore. Now Paul says, we are seated with him, secure, resting victorious, in the Holy of Holies, in the very presence of God, where His glory and power are most fully known. My friends, I find that blows me away. That is stupendous. But that's the reality of what we're told here in God's Word. All that Christ has is ours. Amazing. So what is true of him is what, is what is true of us is true of him because we are in him. Salvation, my friends, is far greater than forgiveness or peace or any other blessing. It's total. It's permanent. This identification with the Savior. That is so, that's why it's so absurd that a Christian can lose his faith. It's impossible. I remember as a young, a, a young Christian in, in uh, a Sazra fellowship in 
Osnabrück in Germany way back in 1994. This poor girl came in to our fellowship. She had reached out in her own mind to lay hold of Christ. She had been badly taught. And she had fallen into some sin. And sadly, she was so depressed because she felt she was spiraling back into a lost eternity in hell. My friends, that is not the case for the Christian. The Christian is a person who is united to Christ and cannot be disunited from him. Just imagine if Jesus lost one of his sheep. The Bible says, no one can pluck them out of my hand. We are as secure as Christians are those who are already in heaven if we are in Christ. That's why it's so absurd to think that a Christian can fall away. Well, he might backslide, but he cannot fall away. Sadly, sometimes our preaching can be too man-centered. And sometimes we come out with glib statements, I have put my trust in Christ. And sometimes we find maybe the next day that my faith is weak. And I'm not just committed to him as I should be. Well, that happens to the Christian, but that doesn't mean that they're falling, they're falling away. What we need to do tonight, my friends, as we look at this amazing doctrine of our union with Christ, it, we must work this doctrine into the very fibers of our thinking so that you understand it fully. You are in Christ. Professor, again, let me quote Professor John Murray. He states this. The perspective of God's people is not narrow. It is broad and long, not confined to space and time, but from the electing love of the Father in the councils of eternity to final glorification with Christ. And Murray goes on to say this. The former has no beginning. The latter has no end. Our salvation, in that sense, has no beginning and has no end. It was from all eternity we were elected into the family of God. And there is no end. Planned before time and space existed and endures when time and space is no more. If you're a Christian here tonight, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and cannot be taken from it. Our salvation is a magnificent, permanent, mighty act of God which changes our whole identity. The Spirit now guides and forms us more and more into the likeness of Jesus, more into the likeness of his family. The same Christ has overcome every temptation. And he was perfectly obedient. That Christ is in you now. That Christ is in you. The Jesus who had compassion on the crowds and who healed the sick. That Jesus is in you. The humble Jesus who led as a servant to washing his disciples' feet. He's in you. The Jesus who suffered and loved to the end, he dwells in you. And the Jesus who was raised in new life, that Jesus is living in you right now. My friends, as Christians, do you really realize the resources that you carry around with you? Do you realize that you are never, ever again alone to face whatever you are facing in life? And this is why Paul prays for us. And this is, I'm quoting Ephesians 1.18, that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, Paul prayed that you may know the hope to which he has called you, 
What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? Ephesians 1.18. Then in Ephesians 3.17, he also prays that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Perhaps you might find it strange that Paul prays for something that is already true since he is writing here to Christians. We are to grow up in every way into Christ. The metaphor makes clear that we are already in Christ definitively and objectively. And now we are to grow up into him experientially and subjectively. Jesus, my friends, was the perfect human being. He was fully human, subject to all our temptations, and he lived a perfect human life. He is what human is supposed to look like. We often look to human as inherently flawed as an excuse for our own shortcomings. Christ in us now labors to make us more human, not less human. As we look at the world out there tonight, they seem to be making themselves less human because they're moving away from what God himself said at the very beginning in Genesis 1. Something has changed. We became a new creation in Christ. And that process of sanctification goes on as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Notice how Paul continually mentions Christ. What an example is this for us? He says, I'm alive in Christ. I'm seated in Christ. And we are his workmanship created in Christ. Paul's constant refrain as we read his letters surely shows us that Paul was possessed with Christ. He was Christ-centered, dominated by Christ. As he tells us himself, this is what he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the source of our salvation. Everything depends on him and on him alone. My friends, there is salvation in no one else but in the finished work of Christ. So that's what union with Christ means. You are in Christ and Christ in you. My friends, is there anything more amazing? This blows me away. When I stop and think about what it means for me to be united with Jesus Christ. Is there any truth that we need more today? As Christians, to lay hold of this great truth, our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself knew that it can be hard for us to believe this truth. He knew that. How do we know that? Well, if we go to uh, John 17... Jesus is high priestly prayer. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, they also may be in us. I in them, and you in me, so that the world may believe that you have sent me and love them as you have loved me. My friend, whatever is true of Jesus in God's eye, is now true of you if you're a Christian here tonight. That, my friends, is union with Christ. Union with Christ means that you are in Christ. No man can come to the Father except through me. And the terrors of the law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood Hide all my transgressions from view. 
May God, by His Spirit, enlighten our eyes this evening and our understanding so that we may begin to comprehend this mighty working of God's power in us. Dare I say it, even more wonderful that we are in Christ, that we sit and stand here in Dingwall tonight, that Jesus is in your body and in mind by His Spirit. Dare I say that it is even more wonderful that you and I are in Christ in heaven. We need both. We need to remember both. But let us not overlook this New Testament emphasis. Not only is he, is he in us, but praise God, we are in heaven. That means we are in that place where we cannot be threatened or hurt or lost. We are a people who are secure and who are kept. And it's important we keep this at the forefront of our thinking, especially when I am tempted to indulge in sin. My friend, remember this. If you are tempted to indulge in sin, who are you taking with you into that sin? If Christ dwells with you, Christ is being taken into that place. That's a fearful thought. God calls me to remember that I'm in Christ. How can I do such a thing? What is important for us this evening is not what I say, but what is important is what Christ is saying to us tonight through his word. And as we look for motivation for our daily living, let us remind ourselves that we're in Christ. The power of sin's reign is broken in Christ. For you, you have new power, new life in Christ. There is absolutely nothing you need to get from him to seeing him face to face that he hasn't already given you himself and he will keep you in union with him and that union my friends becomes communion and faith becomes sight oh my friends what a glorious saviour I was reading a, a book, and I just picked this up, but I thought it was, I'm just going to mention as I close, um, and it was an illustration I saw in a book on union with Christ, which has recently been published. Now I can't remember the name of the author. I should do. Imagine a little boy wearing his father's dress shirt. He is already fully clothed, you could say, but he is still a little boy. He will have to grow up into his new covering until it fits him. In the same way, we are already fully clothed in Christ and in his righteousness. But life in Christ is one of growing up into this new, this new uh, uh, suit until it fits us. You are not striving to attain it. You are striving to lay hold of what is already yours. Hey, that's good news. You're growing into it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you have delivered us in Jesus Christ from the dominion of sin and of death. And you've brought us into the reign of grace and life. Lord, help us to daily bathe in this reality and that you would help us to help one another 
and especially those of us often confused and wondering and perhaps weak. We pray that you would help us constantly to, be, to bring each other back to this anchor, our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That, in so many ways, gives such stability to us as Christians as we live our lives. So help us, O oh Lord, to live our lives constantly to your glory. Help us to remind ourselves that we are your children, united to you. Those who are rich in grace, in Jesus Christ. What an amazing position to be in as your children. So bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our final praise is I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and clean.
eternal Father, again, we thank you for this amazing privilege of being able to gather collectively to worship you on the eve of your day. Lord, challenge us from your word tonight and give to us, as we leave this building, a, a renewed vision to be more like Christ and to want to reach out with the glorious good news of the gospel. And now as we part one from the other, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.